check, check, Hope check. of a baby crying light breaks over your horizon I'm caught in the fall and the rise of your tide like mountains born in fire born again by your desire I'm caught in the heart of the world you conspire you are making all things new you are making
doubt the truth that keep your dreams at bay. Don't stand and wait for the time to call. Come on, come on, catch me, we got miles to run. We are alive and skinny, leaving these bones. Fire in the wind, we're burning out of control. We are the children chasing wondrous things, chasing a vision, baby, like we're running down hell. We tear these curtains open, feel the light, swim to the surface, let our lungs ignite. Slip past the guards before they raise the guns. Come on, come on, catch me, we got miles to run. We are alive and skinny, leaving these bones. Fire in the wind, we're burning out of control. We are the children chasing wondrous things, chasing a vision, baby, like we're running down hell. found I was cold and couldn't speak I started hearing something in the silence next to me I remember now in December how like a split second dream I heard a summer song if I get it wrong you can find it in the east it's going it's going say that I was well, but there's a certain sickness that's better than health, cause every day was another way of trying to get back to the dream of the summer song, if I get it wrong, you can find it in the East. Thank school. you. Okay, there we are. Got loud all of a sudden. Hey, uh, it's great to have you all here today. If you're visiting with us, thanks for being here. I, we have a lot of controlled chaos going on this morning, so I'm going to steer you through it here. We have uh, we have a great service today. This is mostly a student-led service for you this morning, so it's going to be wonderful to see what the students do. We have the student worship band with us. It's going to be great. They're doing. They're sounding really good. We have a baptism today. It's going to be great to see that. That's one of the wonderful things we can see. Now, as you, some of you know, if you're a visitor, this is not a typical service because this is our family service. So we have multiple generations, except for the very youngest, 
Um, we have uh, everybody here is in the service worshiping together, and it's great that we can do that, and we're in a country where we can worship freely with our families, and that's going to make it a very special service in and of itself. Um, so uh, it's going to be a little different today, but it's going to be exciting. Um, also, tonight is our volunteer banquet, so you see a lot of things going on. There's uh, some pigs roasting out there. Uh, lights around. There's a lot of different smells and everything you're going to have here today, and that is because we're having a luau tonight for the volunteers. So if you're a volunteer, you should have already been planning on going to that. If you are not a volunteer, this is the most one of the most exciting things that happens all year. It, this luau is going to be best uh, best you've ever had this side of the Pacific Coast. So um, if you uh, are not a volunteer, be a volunteer next year. You can be part of the volunteer banquet. So it's a great thing. You're going to hear a little bit about that, to, uh, how you can serve in student ministry from Josh in just a minute. Um, last thing that I want to say is there is a meeting for our church plant. You know, we are about planting churches. Will Dobby is planting a church here very soon. Uh, it is called Emmanuel. It's going to be in downtown area. And um, they are having an interest meeting right after this service. Uh, in the study, which is kind of in that far corner. So you can just ask anybody if you don't know directions. But if you have any interest in that, want to be part of that, please attend that. Will will be there, and, and there'll be a lot of good information on that. So that is it for me this morning. I'm going to pass it off to Josh, who's sauntering over here as we speak. And uh, Sauntering, I don't even know what that means. Um, well, hey, guys, the fall semester is upon us, which, as we like to say around here, means it's football time in Tennessee. Um, yeah, go sports. Um, or for the rest of us, it's the overpriced pumpkin spice latte season. And uh, with that comes the fall launch of our student ministry. And so to give you guys a little heads up of what's happening, uh, we have in prof students two primary age groups that we're trying to make disciples of. On Sunday mornings during the 11 o'clock hour, our 7th and 8th graders meet in the studio for what we call Midway. There's no major change there. That's happening as normal. And Promotion Sunday is coming, I believe, on August 14th, which is when every grade level officially moves up to the next age group. And uh, so we'll have our 6th graders coming in there. And then we do have a major change, though, for our high school ministry. Originally, you may have heard it's called Nightlight. We used to meet on Wednesday evenings. But now we are making a major shift. We're now calling it The Gathering. And it's it's going to be on Sunday evenings instead. And so we made this strategic decision because we saw that actually we could reach way more students that way. There's way more availability of people because of sports, schedules, extracurriculars, and stuff like that. So um, one, of, one of the things that we want to do, just like Providence as a whole, is we want to make, grow, and unleash disciples. And we believe as a church that best is going to happen through relational discipleship. And that takes on multiple forms. And so we're going to be changing some things up, for instance, for the gathering on Sunday nights. One thing we're going to hope to try to do this semester is like the roughly the first Sunday of every month. We want to have a really fun social, relational hangout thing that may even be off campus. And uh, basically, there's a lot of different communication things that need to be in place in order for that to go well. Um, if we want to allow kids to come to know Jesus, sometimes that's going to take us being off campus, and that's going to be something that's fun and relational, no bait and switch, you know, turn or burn kind of stuff, but uh, just building relationships off campus or even just to grow and strengthen the bonds that we have right here with the students that we already know. And so, so every now and then we're going to be doing that. And the best way for you to be involved, if we have this QR code up here. Um, if you are a parent of a student, you can go ahead and pull out your phone. I don't know if you even knew this would happen, but uh, you can turn on your camera and it'll scan that right there. And then you're able to fill out a quick little form. This ensures that you are going to be a part of our parent email list. Um, we want to, every month, just before the month gets going, we want to send out a very detailed list of everything going on. And um, also, if, if you don't, if you think you're supposed to be signed up for those already, you're not receiving them, check your spam folder. We've been hearing that some people are getting it through there, but that's going to give you all the information, um, the location, the time. If anything's ever going to change, we're going to let you know, and the best way to know that is through email. So go ahead and fill out that form if you would so that you are on our monthly parent email. We should be sending one out um, tomorrow, in fact. 
So, uh, yeah, thank you for partnering with us as we work together at, with you as parents as the lead, but us as servants to help you in making, growing, and unleashing disciples of your own students. In fact, like um, we said earlier, we have the student worship band here. We're excited for them to lead us. And so why don't we take a moment together to pray to get our mindsets on the Lord as we continue in a time of corporate worship. God, you are already in our presence. Um, you don't have to be invited. You are already here and you are among us. And we thank you that, um, that you do meet with us, such unworthy people who don't deserve to be in your presence. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done for us, that the reason we have breath in our lungs, the reason that we have another day to live, another day to sing your praises is solely because of your sacrifice for us and for our sin. Thank you that we don't have to come as people who have it all together, but we can come broken, confessing our need for you. And that's why you're worthy of our worship. So, um, God, as you were already amongst us, would you allow our hearts of stone to become hearts of flesh and for us to worship truly in spirit and in truth? Um, so thank you for your kindness towards us. Would you help us get our gaze fixed on you and not the things of this world? Um, we love you, and may this be a, a service to you this morning. Amen. Amen. You guys stand together if you're able. And we are, uh, we're we're going to start out singing this morning a song called House of the Lord. Uh, and that's not this box that we're in, by the way, the house of the Lord. That's us. We are God's dwelling place, his people. Where we are, he is. So when we sing, there's joy in the house of the Lord, we're talking about us, this group right here. All right? So let's sing this together, everybody.
house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout Good singing together. You guys can have a seat. Uh, we're going to do something we love to do here at Providence, which is to celebrate a baptism, and it is a celebration. Baptism is this beautiful symbol that Jesus gave us um, of becoming united with him, of having our sin washed away from us, having ourselves purified, and joining him in his death and in his resurrection by faith. We are uh, as we say, buried with Christ in baptism, and then we are raised as we come up out of the water to a new life, to live in a new way as a new creation. That's what this points to, and so uh, I just want to uh, give you that kind of overview as we begin here, and now let's listen to this awesome testimony together. Hi, my name is Chloe, and I'm here to be baptized. So I went to this camp called Smoky Mountain Christian Camp around 2019 and a lot of my friends were there and they were getting baptized and I wanted to get baptized too to not like get left out and like to fit in. So I talked to my dad and I told my dad, hey dad, I want to get baptized and he told me to don't do anything if I'm not ready. So I went up to my room and I prayed to God and I told him, to guide me and lead me into the right path. And right after I prayed that prayer, life wasn't going so well for me. I was barely passing my classes. I wasn't doing well in soccer. We moved out of the house I grew up in and we were having some family problems. And I pushed God away because I couldn't trust him anymore and I didn't know why all those bad things were happening to me. And I went to the same camp, Smoky Mountain Christian Camp, and I saw this junior faculty member, and we were really similar. Like, we both had lots of siblings, and our lives were kind of the same. And I was talking to him. We were talking about how we, our, our relationships with God, and I told him that I couldn't trust God and that I pushed him away. And he showed me this verse. It was Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And he told me that everything happens for a reason and that the hand that holds you molds you. And I realized that God's plans are bigger than mine and that I shouldn't be pushing him away and I should be glorifying him. When I surrendered to Jesus, it wasn't a moment. It was a whole process because there were times where I loved Jesus and then there were times where I just didn't trust him and I like, I didn't put my faith in him and I put my faith in other things. Now I don't think of Jesus as someone who lets bad, the bad things happen. I think of him as someone I should glorify and now I, I share the gospel to my friends and to people who don't have Jesus in their heart and I read my Bible. So before I got saved, I I was like, well, oh, well, Jesus died for me. I don't, he died for everyone and wasn't really impactful to me. But after I got saved, I was like, whoa, he like, he died for me. Like that's really, that's really big. Emotionally, I felt loved and awestruck and I think I should be like taking this more seriously and not just saying like, oh, Jesus died for me, but like, 
he did so many other things, like he did so many other miracles, and he died for you. Good morning, Providence Church. My name is Elizabeth, and this is Chloe, as you've just met. Um, and we have known each other for about a year now. When you were new to Midway, I was new to Providence, and so I became her small group leader, and it has been my privilege to walk through this year with her and to see her as you've already seen just the Spirit of God at work in her life um, and her beautiful testimony. And so today, Chloe, I have two questions for you. The first is, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Yes. <laughs> and do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? That's wonderful. Well, then it is my privilege as your sister in Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> What a great thing, and what a great day we've had already. It's, uh, all these things are intentional, y'all, and for those of you who are part of Providence, if you're new here, welcome to you. My name's Chad, and just want you to know that today you came the right day because of this family service, I mean, our students leading. All of this is intentional, guys, because we're about making, growing, and unleashing disciples. And that starts from the youngest of ages, uh, and that goes on and on in the way that we plant churches. Um, and, and God is moving in such a way, and that means that we've got to see people become disciples young and then, and then say, hey, I want to be a part of the mission. I want to be a part of sharing the, the gospel and being a part of helping people plant churches and helping people find Jesus, and this is all what's happening today is very important. So kids, I'm super excited that you guys are in here with us today, and I hope you got your little uh, you know, note thing with your pictures that you're going to help us by drawing. That's how kids get to take notes. I'm kind of jealous a little bit, actually. Um, but we're going to all do this together, and it's going to be a fun day. The kids have been, uh, at least in Discovery Street, they've been studying heroes and villains, right? Y'all been studying heroes and villains, you kids that are in here? Is that right? Somebody talk to me. Yeah? Okay. I think they said yes. And um, that, but today we get to see the greatest of all heroes, and the greatest of all heroes is Jesus. And um, we're we're going to talk about him. We're, in fact, he is. He's the Christ. He is the chosen King. Is what that means. He is the Messiah. He is God's Son. He is God in the flesh. He's the King, who God promised would be coming. Uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years, all throughout the Old Testament, God promised that the Messiah, the King, the Christ is coming. And, uh, and, that's, and that's Jesus. Today, Matthew is where we are, the book of Matthew, first book in the New Testament. Uh, but we're seeing Matthew, who was actually one of Jesus' disciples, who experienced Jesus saving him. Um, and then he followed Jesus, and he's kind of our guide. And we've been studying the book of Matthew, Matthew here. And today, Matthew's going to show us a shift that Jesus makes, for those of you that have been studying Matthew with us, um, that, that comes right after the Pharisees had decided that they were going to destroy him. Um, we saw a couple of weeks ago that Jesus withdrew after that and uh, seeking to avoid bringing this confrontation uh, with the Pharisees and religious leaders and the rulers of the Jewish nation at that time to a head. And so he, he, he knew it wasn't the time, so he kind of withdrew at that moment. But he's still very popular. People found him. In fact, Matthew chapter 13 is where we are. And we're going to start this chapter today. Matthew 13, and it starts like this. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and he sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. Now, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about this, using my imagination a little bit, but it doesn't take a lot because of how good Matthew describes this, about Jesus walking out of the house that he was staying in. We're, we're imagining this is Capernaum, which, which was his kind of home base city. And he walks out of the house and he People see him walk out of the house, and he's a celebrity, right? So they're, they're, they start following him, and he goes down by the sea, and, and he does what great teachers did. He sits down, meaning, I'm about to speak. That's what they did. And so everybody starts gathering. I mean, I'm, I'm imagining the whole town empties out, and they go gather up on the beach by the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a lake. It doesn't have, like, waves. You know, it's a peaceful, quiet place. 
And they crowd so many, so many people that he grabs a boat, maybe a fisherman nearby. I mean, he was well connected with the fisherman community. He had about a bunch of them who, who were in his disciples. And he gets the boat and they go out a little bit from the, from the beach where everybody can get close. And, you know, it's kind of like your natural amphitheater. And by the way, if you've ever been around the lake much, you can hear quiet conversations that fishermen have on the bass boat in the morning because of the way sound carries over water. It's an amazing thing. And Jesus has this perfect, incredible environment. I mean, I wish I could have been there. It's just so cool. And then he says this. I hope you can see this in your mind. And he told them many things in parables. Now, before we see exactly what he said, let's remember that Matthew's arranged his gospel around five big speeches, five discourses that Jesus gave. This is the third one. Sermon on the Mount was the first one. The second one was the instructions to the disciples as he was sending them out on mission. And now there's this one. And, and I'll just tell you, it gives us a chance to see something here that I hope you notice. First of all, it's how, um, how, how Jesus changes tactics in the way that he speaks, in the way that he communicates. Um, he begins to speak, Matthew says, in parables. Now, Matthew shows a bunch here in this chapter, and, and we're going to take, it's going to take us three weeks, adults, to, to see all of these parables that Matthew gives us in one chapter, which I could have taken literally nine weeks to do this, because there are nine parables that Jesus fires, bam, 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 bam. But, but remember here, um, Jesus' first was the Sermon on the Mount where he's very clearly saying this is what the kingdom is all about. He's, this is what my people look like, poor in spirit, you know, mourning their sin. Um, um, they, they're, they're meek. They surrender. Uh, they're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. He talks about the kind of person that's a part of Jesus' kingdom, that's invited to the kingdom. And then he talks about how that person lives. And it's very clear and very straight up about this is how you need to be. It was hard. But it, was, it was tough. It challenged everybody's idea of what a kingdom is, but it was very clear. And that's what was the first one was about. The second one was these instructions about sending his disciples out on missions. Hey, guys, it's going to be hard. You're going to be persecuted, but this is what I want you to do every town you go into, and it's, it's very clear. And, and as a result of that mission, in fact, after that second speech, more people are following Jesus. They hear all over Israel because these 12 disciples went out. And so they, they, they're, it, it made Jesus even more popular. And he started getting the pushback, of course, after that from the religious leaders and the ruling establishment. Well, today we begin this phase of Jesus' teaching where he communicates with parables. There's stories. Stories. Jesus tells stories. And after he tells this first one, which is the best the one that sets the stage for all of them. It's the one that really illustrates why he does this. Well, he, he's going to tell um, why he makes this shift in the way that he teaches after he tells the first parable. In fact, that's kind of what the parable is going to be about. Well, let's see it, okay? You ready? We're going to read it together. This is Jesus' first parable when he shifts this strategy for teaching. He says, A sower went out to sow. Now, y'all, this was a, a picture, a sower sowing, that everyone understood most people would have done this in their life in that day and time. Because, why? Because today we go to the, you know, if we, if we get hungry and we need some food, we go to the grocery store. And we have no clue how the bread got in the package and sliced and ended up on my table, you know, with bologna in the middle. I like bologna. <laughs> Especially smoked bologna. But that's another thing. But sandwiches, you know, it's like it just appears on our table. And, and we're like, oh, it, well, it appeared in the store. No. There's, there's a process. And everyone in the ancient world understood. They didn't have, you know, Ingalls and, and, and Food City and Walmart and all these places where you can just go buy something. They had to grow it themselves for the most part. And then they all knew farmers who grew it for people that couldn't grow it for themselves. And so what that meant was... There was this process of planting fields for wheat. 
because you had to plant the wheat and grow the wheat, and then you took the grain from that wheat, and you, you, know, you had to do all the process. And in, in, third world, in, in, in undeveloped countries today, you still can watch this same thing happen. This is a universal thing that even it's hard, it's not even hard for us in 2022 to understand what this is go- what's going on here. This sower is a guy that takes a bag, usually a cloth bag, full of seed that he had saved from the last year's crop for this very purpose. And he goes out there and he basically starts scattering the seed. And I've seen this, I've seen this in undeveloped countries where they don't have the fancy sowers or the tractors or anything like that. They, after they've worked the field and worked the field and worked the field, usually behind a horse or a, or a mule or, a, or, a, or a, a, an oxen team, they have worked the field, and, and they've got it ready for planting. And then the guy walks out on the right day, and he takes his hand, and he throws a seed. And he takes his hand in the bag, and he throws a seed. And he takes the hand. It's kind of a rhythm. It's like, whoop, every step. Whoop, whoop, I mean, every step. And he does it so well that it perfectly spreads it out. Well, just picture that in your mind. And look what it says. Now, by the way, I do this today in my grass seed. I don't know. I'm not very successful as a grass grower, <laughs> to be honest with you, especially this time of year. Every year, I'm just really ticked off because I work so hard in the fall to plant the grass seed, and it looks so good. And then June comes, and it just burns it all up, and I don't know what, what the deal. Maybe I'll understand from Jesus' parable. Anyway, we understand what's happening here. So a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, he's throwing the seed. Some seed fell among, along the path. Now, that's the hard ground, which in that day and time, they didn't have sidewalks, and they didn't have streets, paved streets like we do. Well, actually, they had some Roman roads, but those were kind of like the highways. No, in every Middle Eastern town in Jesus' day, most people spent most of their time walking where they had to walk by certain paths. And they just were feet hardened, Dirt paths that, after a while, are harder than the concrete that, that is in this building under our feet. Because they've walked on it and walked on it and walked on it and walked on it, and, and it's just hard as a rock. Really, literally hard as a rock. And it's so hard that the seed that lands on it just kind of bounce, bounces and just laid there. Well, on the first blank in your notes, kids... I want you to write hard soil. There's a place for you to write what kind of soil this is. And you can write down at the bottom underneath that first picture, write hard soil. Hard, H-A-R-D. Because that's what it was. It was hardened from all the people walking over it. And it says, and the birds came because the seed just bounced on that hard soil. And it and devoured the seed. That seed didn't have a chance, y'all. You know why? Because the birds are sitting on every little fence post and every little place, and they're waiting to just come down. I mean, I'm sure every time those birds, you know, we've got some purple martins in, in, uh, in, uh, along my driveway. They live. And every time I mow up and down that driveway, those purple martins just stand there and watch me. They just they get on the telephone poles. They, they, just, they just watch me mow. You know why? Because I'm stirring up all the bugs that they like to eat. And as soon as that happens, and they come behind my mower, and they just woof, shoop, shoop. They're just waiting for that mower. Birds aren't dumb. They know. They're waiting. And, and so these birds are watching this sower get his, you know, cream-colored bag, whatever color it was, and he, they knew there's the seed. There, here he comes, and some of that seed's going to be bouncing on that path. And as soon as he passes by, they're gobbling that seed up. Mealtime. <laughs> Look at verse 5. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground where they did not have much soil. Kind of like some places in my yard where the gravel was spread before you know, while construction was going on when we built our house. And to this day, I still can't get, there's no way to get the gravel out of some parts. You know, when, when they spread gravel in parts of your yard, it's like there's just as much gravel as there is dirt. Some places there's more. And I've tried to grow grass there. And I, I totally get this because here's what you should put under, your, under that picture, the second picture. You should put in your blank, rocky soil. Rocky soil. That's just, there's more rock than dirt. 
It's not optimum. You know, when you're planting a garden, you don't want lots of rocks in your garden because there's just, it, there's not enough nutrients. There's not enough place for water to stay. And, and there's not enough, you know, soil. They need soil. And immediately it says, they sprang up. And since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. And by the way, that's exactly what happens in my yard. Every year I try to plant in this places where the, you know, the gravel was previously spread in my yard. And I don't want gravel there. I want grass there. And I'll plant grass, uh, grass seed like crazy. And man, I get excited every fall when that grass just whoosh, comes up. Man, it looks like, hey, finally, I'm going to have grass at this place. And then sure enough, it doesn't take long before that new grass just can't make it. It just dies. It just, as soon as the first hot day, you can just watch it almost just wither away and turn brown. I know what this is, what Jesus is saying here. I get this. Verse 7, other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Now again, y'all, I, I get this, and I hope you do too. I've seen this in the edge of our yard. We've got a really great place where the, the, the soil's really rich, and, but there's generations of briars that have been living there and weeds. And actually, this is a place where Dar Darla always wants to plant her little flower garden every year. And you know what we do? We have the constant battle of the flowers and the seeds that we planted that are not native to the area with the seeds that are, or the, or the, the roots and the, the native plants that have been there for generations. You know who wins? You got it. The native plants. The ones that are from there. The ones that every year are just waiting for the sun to come and just they just thrive. In fact, the same thing happens to us. I'll plow it and everything and then we'll plant those seeds and the little seeds will start up and then we think, oh good, it's going to happen this year. And then here come the thorns. They just grow up. It's amazing. Well, in your blank there, put crowded soil. Because like with my yard, this is the place where those poor little seeds that this sower is sowing are just crowded by all the native grasses and plants and thorns. So it's the crowded soil. Verse 8, other seeds fell on good soil. Good soil. Now that's the word clear, I mean it is literally what the Greek says. Good soil. It's actually kalege. It means good earth, good ground, good soil. Now we know what this is, don't we? I mean, even if you've never been a farmer and you're driving in the country one day and you see a, a, a plowed field and you see how dark and rich and soft the soil looks. You know what I'm talking about? We know. I mean, instinctively, we know that that dark, rich, soft Soil is good soil, and it's been plowed, and it's been disked, and it's been fertilized, and, and it's been watered. Well, in your blank, I just want you to put that, good soil, okay? That's what should go there. Well, what happened to that seed that fell on the good soil? Do you guys, I mean, we probably know what, we don't even have Jesus to, Jesus doesn't even have to finish. We know what happens, don't we? It says that it produced grain, so it grew up and didn't die. It grew up and got healthy, and then it started a little head of, 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 of the wheat that ha happens on the end of a wheat stalk. While it's even green, and these little bitty grains start forming, and then it just gets bigger and bigger, and then it turns golden, and the, the wheat, it, and, and what does Jesus say? It produced grain, some a hundredfold. You know what that means? That means there are, for every one plant, from that one seed comes a hundred new seeds. Some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. But the point is, all of it bore all kinds of new seeds. It all had new fruit. He who has ears, Jesus says. This is an important verse, verse 9. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, kids, just look up for just a second. Would you look around, people around you? Does everybody have ears here? Now, I know some people have got like long hair and it's covering, but just, did you see anybody without any ears at all? I, I don't know. I, 
I think Jesus is trying to say here that everybody needs to be listening to this. In fact, whenever Jesus says this phrase, what he's saying is he wants everybody to know that what he had just said was very important and that we should not just hear it, you know, our eardrums being vibrated by the sound waves hitting, hitting in our eardrums, but that we should hear it with our hearts. That's what he's saying. And my dad used to say that all the time. Because you, you can hear things and not listen, you know? It's kind of like when, when you're playing a video game and uh, you're really into it and you're about to break a new record and then all of a sudden your mom calls from the other part of the house and says, hey, did you clean up your room? You know, that's where you just conveniently don't listen. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, your mind is focused on this. This is very important. It's a video game, mom. Come on, mom. I'm about to break the record. Hey, did you clean up your room? That is so not important to me right now. I'm going to act like I didn't even hear it. That's called hearing and not listening. My dad used to say this, hey, son, and he would make me look at him. He'd say, look at me for a second. Are you hearing or are you hearing? And I knew exactly what he meant when he said that. Because oftentimes I didn't hear. Hearing with your heart. It's really cool. So <laughs> as far as we can tell from Matthew's Story telling about Jesus, what he did here, and by the way, this is affirmed in, in, in Luke and in Mark. That was it. That was the end of what Jesus said to this crowd. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. He had this huge crowd gathered at the lake. He, he takes the trouble to get a boat, push it out a little bit. It's an incredible environment. And then he says this little story, and it's over that quick. And the disciples saw this. In verse 10, look what they said. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Because he didn't used to do this. Because they remember the Sermon on the Mount. Because they remember when he was telling them what to do when they, when they go to these different cities on mission. He didn't do this. He didn't speak like this. He was very direct. He was very blunt. There's no way you can miss what he was saying. But here he's not doing that. And they're going, why are you doing this, Jesus? I mean, you had a huge crowd. You kind of blew it, Jesus. Actually, you kind of blew it. You blew a great opportunity here. Verse 11, and he answered them. To you, talking to his disciples, those who have believed in him, those who have followed. He says, for those of you who have followed me, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Did you get that language? It has been given to know? Just hang on to that for just a second. But to them, those in the crowd, many who have not yet believed, many who have heard him before and, and decided not, they didn't want it to believe, including Pharisees and scribes and, and, and religious leaders and other Jewish leaders. They were in that crowd and many of them have already rejected Jesus. They had already said, no, you know, I don't think he's the Messiah. He said, to them, it has not been given. Now that's interesting because that's passive language that somebody besides the people hearing, they're not, it's not entirely their doing. It, some, something is given here. Something is given, the ability to hear, the ability to listen with your heart. Anyway, just hang on to that for just a second. And then he says, for to the one who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance, a lot. But to the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now guys, kids, I just want to ask you, does that sound fair to you? It's kind of like, you know, Jesus is handing out popsicles, and there's a lot of people with popsicles, and he gives them more, but the ones that don't have any, whatever it is they have, he's taking things away from them? What? Come on, is that fair? Is that fair? Does anybody think that's fair? Now, don't say, well, Jesus must have done it. It must have been fair. I don't know about you, but that bothers me a little bit. Shouldn't he be giving it to the people that don't have it? Instead of giving more to the people that do? Sounds like that's what he's saying. In verse 13, he says, This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. And then he quotes what Isaiah said. 
You will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. And then Jesus says, for this people's heart has grown dull. You know that word is sometimes translated in some different Bible translations, calloused. Their hearts have been calloused. You know what calloused means? Have you ever shaken a hand of a farmer and you feel like he's still got his gloves on because his hands are so rough and and thick and tough and the skin? You know, some farmers that I've known, their hands were so tough, they could, they could work an ax all day long and never get a blister, never even feel any pain on their hands. But me, a guy that does a lot of reading and sits inside a whole lot, if I start working on wood, which I do you know, in our yard, it's no time before blisters and my hands hurt for days. Not the farmer, not the guy who's used to working with his hands. Or, you know, I'll go around, you know, in some other nations, you know, most recently in Africa, and every nation it seems it's like this, but kids will be out in the fields playing on rocky fields and playing soccer. And, and they'll, they'll be doing it barefoot. And they'll be doing it in, a, in you know, fields with rocks all in the field, maybe even gravel field, a gravel lot or something. And, they're, and they don't have a soccer ball, so they're playing with a rock or they're playing with a grapefruit or something. Yeah. It's real. I've seen it happen. And they're running full speed, and they're cutting and turning on that rocky ground, and I'm thinking, how are they doing that? When my, my feet are hurting while I'm just watching them, you know? Because I can't even walk across the, my paved driveway with my feet, but my feet are so tender. Calloused. Feels like they've got shoes on. They don't feel any pain. That's good, but, a pos- but that's a negative when Jesus says a calloused heart, right? Because that means it's not soft. It's not able to feel. It's, 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 it's covered over with, with scar tissue. Hardened heart. And with their ears, Jesus continues, they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Jesus is saying some people get hardened, some people get calloused, some people just don't hear. If they did hear and they called out to me, I would hear them, but they don't. (laughs) Verse 16, but blessed, he says to his disciples, are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Jesus is saying several things here, y'all. Let me just give you a few. First, I'm doing exactly what the prophets, concluding Isaiah, said that I would do. That I'm the king, and I'm doing exactly what they said the king was going to do. Secondly, most of the people are also doing what Isaiah said they would do. They would see my actions, proving that I'm of the Christ. They would hear my words, which are from God, but they do not, they, they will not believe and obey because they don't want to. And thirdly, But you disciples are blessed because you really see who I am and you really hear with your hearts. Not just hear, but hear. Verse 17, for truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and didn't see it and long to hear what you hear but did not hear it. In other words, Isaiah years ago would have loved to have seen and heard me speak and the things that I do. David would have loved to have seen it. When God promised Isaiah and promised to David what, 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 what I would be like when I came, when, when the Messiah comes, they would have, they longed to see this, but, but they didn't get to. When Abraham, when God promised him that one of his seed, the whole world would, 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 would come to believe through, through one of his seed, he longed to see it. Moses, when God said that he would send one greater than Moses one day to save the world, He longed to see it, but he didn't get to see it. And I could go on and on. Jeremiah, Ezekiel. I could just go on and on. All of the Old Testament saints that longed to see the king come. Jesus is saying, they they didn't get to, but you do. Wow. And by the way, so do we. Because we're on this side of the cross. We're on this side of history where we have in the Bible and 2,000 years of Christian history to show us what Jesus does what he did and what he does in people's lives that changes their lives. Wow. So the purpose of Jesus' parables is this. Yes, they're earthly stories about heavenly things. Yes, that's true. 
Jesus uses earthly examples that are easy to understand to tell us about heavenly things that are harder for us to understand. Yes, but it's much more than that. The purpose of Jesus' parables is this. They are filters. They're filters. Those who want to know and see and hear will. Those who don't, won't. Those who have a hungry, believing heart, they will receive so much more because they will actually desire to know what God is saying through Jesus, who is the, in God in the flesh. Those who don't will lose their opportunity and they will be judged. And y'all, that's still true today. It's amazing that we live in a time with more opportunities to hear and see Jesus. More people have more opportunities than any other culture and any other time in the history of the world. Think of all the Bibles that are in your house. Most of the world doesn't have a Bible, for, one for the whole family. Most of the world, there, there may be one Bible in a village, if that. And that's the way it's been through history, but not English Bibles. My goodness, we've got like, how, I don't even know how many dozens of, of different you know, English translations today. And, and they're all available online. If any of you have a phone, if you've got a, a way to get online, you've got access to literally dozens and dozens and dozens of English Bibles. Free. Not to mention all the ones that we have in print. There's that. There's, there's to add to that all the books, the Christian books and gr Christian bookstores, the camps that we even heard about from Chloe early, earlier. The movies, yeah, Pod, Christian podcasts, music, churches everywhere, freedom to go. Guys, we, we have had so much blessing that God has given us. We have every opportunity to hear and to hear, but we don't. Many of us. That there are more, I think, today that reject Christ in spite of all this opportunity to hear today than ever. Jesus could have been talking about our time, seeing that they do not see, he hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Doesn't he? Doesn't it sound like our day? Yeah. Then he says this, all right, verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. Okay, finally, he's going to tell us what this means, and it has everything to do with why he uses parables at this stage in his ministry. Verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, okay? First of all, the word, word, tells us what the seed is. In fact, in Luke's version of the same story, Jesus says in Luke's version, he remembered Jesus saying, the seed is the word. So that's what we have implied here. He doesn't outright say it in Matthew's version, but we do know that it's the word, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. Now, I've got to say something here. Understand means they haven't taken it to heart. It doesn't mean they get it. You know, they're intellectually able to understand. That doesn't mean that. It means that they haven't grasped it for themselves. If they don't understand it, then like the bird, Satan is just sitting on a fence post waiting for the opportunity. And he sees that seed bouncing on a hard soil, on hard hearts. And he comes swooping in and whoop, grabs it. Do y'all know that Satan is at work even right now in this room? He is. I'm talking to you about God's word. We're reading it together. And it's landing out there on different kinds of soil. And Satan sees it bouncing on some of you. Say, ah, you know, this, I, don't, I don't take this seriously. This is not for real. I, I'm, I'm too tired. Or I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat today. Or I'm... You know, oh, when is it going to get done? You know, that kind of thing. And he sees that word bounce, and here he comes. That's what he does. This is what was sown along the path. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't understand again. It, it, it wasn't too difficult. It just meant their hearts were hard and calloused. And the devil took the opportunity. So to draw, if y'all are drawing on your picture, and you've got the birds there, Draw some horns on it. Make them red. Make them look like the devil. Make a frowny face on its beak. Make a scary bird. They were too cute. I saw the pictures. <laughs> There's Satan. 
and he's real. Verse 20, as for what was sown on rocky ground, the second seed, this is the one who hears the word, see, and immediately receives it with joy even. Yet he has no root in himself, but he endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, immediately falls away. How many times have I seen this? You know, somebody will say they'll be in, a, in an emotional meeting. You know, Chloe talked about it, and, and, and God bless her dad for telling her, hey, be careful here, you know, make sure this is right. Make sure you're not just following the crowd, because a lot of times we can get swept up into following the crowd, right? Oh, yeah, well, everybody seems, all my friends are Christians. I want to be baptized too, you know? And, and, we, and we immediately, we go, oh, yes, that's great. And I've seen this happen so many times. And then they go leave the church or leave the camp, and they go back to school, or they go back to home where people aren't believers around them. They go back to work. Adults, it happens to adults all the time. And the culture around them, and they read their Twitter, and they, and they see Instagram, and they see all the stuff that's out there in the world, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I'm the only Christian in the world. That's how they feel. And then you know what happens? Their seed, their little sprout just withers away because it wasn't real. Jesus is telling us. As soon as tribulation comes, as soon as persecution arises, if y'all have been around for a while, you know this in person. You know what it's like. Being a Christ follower isn't always cool. People make fun. They lump you in with all the, you know, Christians who do dumb things, and a lot of them do. Christians. And people make fun, and they lump you in, and they, they share TikTok videos that seem to disprove the Bible. Because everybody on TikTok is an expert. I'm kidding by the way. And that's the heat of the sun. And they can't take it. And they have no root. And they're shallow. And they give up. And they were never true believers. They weren't reborn. They weren't transformed. They weren't surrendered. This seed was, Jesus says, scorched. It withered away. It died. Just like my grass on the same kind of rocky soil every year. Verse 22, but as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. Now, we know this person too, don't we? Yeah, they say they believe. But they get pulled away by the things and the stuff and the money of this world. <laughs> Deceitful riches is what Jesus said. And can I tell you that I promise you that that's what pursuing money and stuff does. It deceives us into thinking that it means something when it doesn't. It's temporary. More than that, it's a distraction. You can't take your money with you when you die. You can. And I know you're all like, well, Chad, we all know that. Well, apparently a lot of people don't because they amass all this stuff. And they even amass so much stuff that they'll give their kids great stuff. And they have big houses, multiple houses oftentimes. And, they, and, and there's nothing wrong with any of these things in themselves. But when that becomes your object, when success for you looks like a certain amount that you make every year and a certain amount of stuff that you have, you have just bought the lie. And you will find out one day that it not only is a big factor in corrupting everybody around you, but it corrupts you. And then you leave and you can't take it with you. Somebody else takes it. You ever been to an estate sale? Weird. It's weird. And then sometimes the family fights over it after the, some of you knows what I'm talking about. The person dies who's wealthy and everybody in their family, they hate each other because they're not getting theirs. Why? Because the person that died taught them that that's what's important. Mm. They have no root, it says here. They, 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 it gets choked out by all these deceitful riches. Jesus said, what does it profit if you gain the whole world and then lose your own soil? Or, I'm sorry, soul. <laughs> Not soil, that's different. Soul. What if you gain everything? What if you're the richest person in the world and you lose your soul? Jesus said that both the rocky soil seed and the seed in the crowded soil 
was heard, but it did not, they did not hear with their hearts. These didn't make it, y'all. They never bore fruit. They never were able to bear more seed, and that's the whole purpose for the grain in the first place. But look at this one, verse 23. Whew, good news. As for what was sown on good soil, ah, good soil. This is the one who hears the word and understands it. In other words, really hears it, receives it, understands it. Wants to know what it means. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, another case 60, another case 30. This soil is good. And I want to make, be careful here because you know, I hope you labeled it good on your, on your sheet there, good soil. But that doesn't mean they do, they're morally good or they're a good boy or a good girl. That doesn't mean that at all. What this means is it's favorable for growing. It's optimum. It's, it's, it's receptive. It's ready. That's what it means here. That's what good soil is. It's not because it's without sin when it regards your heart. It's because it's fertile, it's receptive, it's open to what God wants to do. It's ready to receive and hear, and, and it hears with the heart. So kids, all right, this is what I want you to do on your notes, okay? If you've been following along, I want you to now take maybe your red crayon and mark out the word soil and write heart, just like this, okay? Because that's the meaning of Jesus. Mark out soil and write heart. So there's the hard heart that doesn't want to hear it all, not interested. The devil loves that heart, loves that attitude. Then there's the rocky heart with hardly any depth that will nourish and sustain even when the heat comes, they're done. There's the crowded heart that's choked out by all the stuff and the wealth of a temporary world instead of pursuing the only thing that lasts forever. And finally, there's the good heart, that like healthy, rich, prepared, life-sustaining soil, hears the word, receives it with the heart and obeys it and makes a difference because they then become seed that goes out to other people in the world. It changes, this, this soil changes lives by sharing the word too. So I want to ask you a question now that we've understood what Jesus was saying. Adults, you too, especially you. What soil describes your heart? All right, so what? We got to finish this. First, pray. What do we do with this? Well, we pray. We need to pray that God will give us to know. I'm, I'm using the quote there that he used. He give you to know. It was given to them to know. It was given to them to receive the word. Or it was not given to them. You remember that, that weird phrase that Jesus used? I want to encourage you to pray that God would prepare you to hear his truth, that you would take it to heart, and that you would hold it firmly. Pray that God will grow you and keep you during the droughts, during the storms, during the hard times, during the good times, that you will one day reproduce seed. Pray. That's my first thing. Pray. Pray that God will find it in his pleasure to let you receive the word. Secondly, pursue him. So it's not just God, you know, I'll, I'll give this person a soft heart. I'll give this person a hard heart. I'll give this person. No. Because Jesus is saying this to the crowds in order to say, you've got an option here. This is partly, this is your thing. You can pursue Jesus. The disciples ask the question. They, they follow Jesus. By the way, Chloe in her video, I noticed that I saw her video after I was going to quote two verses after the one she quoted, Jeremiah 29, 29 11, I think she quoted. I know the plans I have for you, plans for good, not for evil. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Two verses later, 
Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You know what that means? God is saying, if, you, if you've got a seeking, hungry heart, you'll find me. But you've got to seek me with everything. And then the last thing is parents. Maybe some of you are going, man, I sure hope my kids are good soil. <laughs> I did. I still do. What can you do to help your kids be good soil? Well, I got about three things for you. First of all, pray every day for their hearts. Pray every day that God will till their heart and make their heart so that they will hear his word. Secondly, demonstrate good soil. Because it tends to be when a parents ha when a parents have a real genuine faith in Jesus and a, a genuine life. That's the one most important, I think, factor in what's going to happen with their kids is do you exhibit good soil in your heart? And then the final thing is get them and you in good environments. If you want to be good soil, you need to be in good environments. Places where the plow will run. Places where fertilizer will be given. Places where I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the body of Christ. You know, we want to make sure if our kids, I want, to, I want my kids to be a great baseball player. Boy, I'm going to find out the best team and the best league and the best this and the best that. And I'm going to get the best equipment. And I'm going to go to, man, we'll do anything. We'll, we'll, we'll spend all of our lives running to tournaments. Believe me, I've done this. So that our kids will be good athletes. We'll get them in the best school so that they'll be intelligent people. But do you get them in a place where they can be spiritually fed? That's most important. So yeah, you know, in fact, our children's ministry, the theme of our children's ministry is rooted in the faith. Now, it's not guaranteed any of these things. It's not like do these things and it's perfect every time. No, because it's between them and God ultimately. But you can be the one plowing the soil. Now, are you taking these words to heart? Do you have ears to hear? Because he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads together. He who has ears to hear, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, Chloe in her baptism video, she said, that she heard many times, oh, he died for me, and I just kind of blew it off. She said, I, I, he, okay, so he died for the whole world. Okay, that's, I understand that. But then there was that time, and I got chill bumps and got a lump in my throat when she said, no, he died for me. Do you realize that? Jesus loves you so much that he came and then he brought you even through whatever's going on in your life to this place at this time right now so that you can hear from his word do you know he died for you because he loves you and you can receive him Have you received him? Have you believed? Have you surrendered to him? If not, do so now.
stand together. He's worthy of our lives. Sing this together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Nothing better than him. We don't have to let things get choked out. His word be choked out by the cares of this world. So we know those things won't fill us anyway. I search the world. But it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, the treasures that fade are never enough. And then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied.
That's right. All right, before we go, y'all, we're going to sing one more together. This is all about God's love for us, the love that causes him to be the one who does scatter the seed and open up our hearts, making good soil there, tilling the soil of our hearts and making us ready to receive it with faith. So let's sing this out together. that you call us. Thank you that you scatter the seed of your word. And thank you. Thank you that for every heart that is good soil, it is good soil because of your grace. Make us that way. Till our hearts and make us ready to hear, ready to respond, to take root and remain rooted. 
in you. We love you. Take us out of here in your grace. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, everybody. Volunteers, we'll see you all here tonight.